Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on supporting independent productions through film rebate and tax incentive programs. This webinar is part of a series of conversations around the recent NEA report, State of the Field, a report from the Documentary Sustainability Summit, which was released in partnership with the International Documentary Association this past August. The report explores issues facing the documentary film community with the goal of articulating tangible, actionable strategies and initiatives to positively impact the field and contribute to a sustainable and healthy ecosystem for documentary professionals. If you haven't already downloaded the report, it's available free of charge as a downloadable PDF from our website, and it's also free of charge as a printed publication which can be requested from our website under the Publications section. Um, on our site at arts.gov. For any groups who would like to request more than one copy of the report, feel free to send us an email at mediaarts at arts.gov. Also, if you'd like additional resources around the report, we have an archived recording of an earlier webinar that gives a brief report overview with special guest Simon Kilmurray, the Executive Director of International Documentary Association, and Michael Bracey, one of the lead consultants for the report and the Documentary Sustainability Summit. Getting back to today's conversation, I'd like to first introduce myself. My name's Jack Stoluka. I'm the Media Arts Director here at the NEA. I'll be moderating today's conversation. We're going to be speaking with a panel of experts about best practices in the field for supporting indie-friendly policies and practices. Whether you're a film commissioner, part of the indie film community, at a state's arts agency or involved in economic revitalization efforts, this webinar will help deepen your understanding of how indie-friendly film rebate and tax incentive programs can serve local economic interests by supporting the small businesses and individuals working in independent productions. I'm incredibly honored to introduce to you the following individuals who will be part of today's conversation. Each panelist brings a wealth of knowledge and experience about film rebate and tax incentive programs. We're incredibly grateful for their time and willingness to participate in this webinar. So thank you, Cynthia, Roddy, Lance, and Her Herbert. Before we get started into the presentation, I'd like to go around and have each panelist briefly introduce themselves. I'm going to start first with Cynthia Lopez, who is also one of the lead consultants on the Documentary Sustainability Summit and the report. Cynthia? Good afternoon, Jax, and all the members of the panel. Uh, a special thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts and to IDA for collaborating on this series of events to assist the documentary field to explore creative business models and to increase sort of sustainability and the ecosystem that supports um, the documentary field. So I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. So thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Roddy? Um, Jax and Sarah and everybody from the NEA, thank you for hosting this webinar, and thank you for including Sundance Institute and the Documentary Film Money Map in this field-wide conversation about sustainability. We're really excited to be contributing to, to this conversation right now. Great. Thanks, Roddy. We're excited to have you. Herbert? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I want to thank the NEA for uh, this report and for starting this conversation. Um, uh, I'm the Associate Director for, of the Film Division for the D.C. Office of Cable, Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment. And uh, among other things, uh, we are charged with supporting the indigenous uh, creative community, which includes the documentary film community. And I'm really excited to be here and, and be a part of this conversation. Great. Thanks, Herbert. And last but not least, Lance Kramer. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lance. Um, I am, I suppose, part of that indigenous film community that Herbert uh, just referenced. Um, I'm a DC a filmmaker in DC. I co-founded with my brother a production company called Meridian Hill Pictures uh, seven years ago in DC. Um, we focus exclusively on producing documentaries. Um, and we most recently released a film called City of Trees, um, which is an independent documentary film um, that also received a tax rebate from uh, the city of DC. 
Um, and so I've been honored to be a part of these conversations that have been going on the last uh, year or so, and I'm uh, grateful to be a part of this conversation too. Great. Thanks, Lance. Okay, so we're just going to get started and go right into some uh, presentations to share about some of the experiences that our panelists have had with um, film incentives and tax rebate programs. So um, we're going to start with Roddy Taylor, and that will trickle into Cynthia Lopez's presentation as they both have been working together on some really exciting work for the Sundance document, uh, the Sundance Doc Money Map, which is um, a really great resource for the field. Um, so I don't want to spoil it for you, so I'm just going to hand this over to Roddy to tell you all about what that is. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, I served as first associate director and then as film funds director for the Sundance Documentary Fund for more than 10 years. And my job was to find, cultivate, support, and champion creative documentary films worldwide um, by awarding financing and creative support. Um, and I noticed something a couple of years ago that I thought was really interesting. Um, I noticed that in a lot of ways, documentary and nonfiction films were moving closer and closer together in terms of their narrative strategies, their visual language, their cinematic tools, their distribution and rollout strategies, their market interventions, and even on the financial side, I noticed that indie fiction films and documentary films um, were getting more similar oftentimes in terms of both micro-budget and bigger-budget films, and in terms of their financing, both beginning to avail themselves of everything from crowdsourcing to private equity. But I noticed something unique about fiction film from documentary film that really puzzled me. And what that was is that I noticed that indie fiction films occasionally would avail themselves of local and state tax incentive programs, and that nonfiction films rarely did. And I couldn't help but wonder why. And at the time, um, Sundance Institute was looking to um, begin to solve a problem about having more independent producers in the field of U.S. documentary. I, we noticed that um, in Europe, there's often uh, a, a whole class of, of producers, but that indie fiction in the United States often has producers, but indie docs don't. So I was actually trying to solve that question when I realized, oh, part of it has to do with the way that we finance indie documentary film. That's what led me to this question about, about the uh, use or the lack of use about um, uh, tax incentives. And as a film funder, I've been looking at indie doc budgets and budget reports for all the time, for almost a decade, I would never see state tax incentives as a production resource. Um, so, um, and initially, I thought that maybe docs weren't eligible for the incentive programs. And when I understood that they might be, that's when we began our research study into the first doc film money map. So the first thing I did was turn to somebody who's beloved to us at Sundance and fieldwide in the documentary field, Cynthia Lopez, who I just have to say, as the first Latina and first documentary specialist to be appointed as the film commissioner of the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, yes, um, <laughs> I think she's phenomenal and she shares this passion. So with her as our guide and consultant, and with um, just the, the leg and brain power of the Sundance Institute staff, I've got to give shouts out to Betsy Tsai um, at Sundance Institute, who really led the field research with our team of amazing interns. I will call them out. Ayana Baraka, Spicy Garahan, um, Spicy Garrick, um, Samantha Garahan, Janelle Augustine. Um, but we set in motion a plan to document state and local initiatives that exist that are friendly to documentaries. Um, and we found the film commissioners and film offices to be friendly and helpful um, in, in giving information, and the result was the first indie film money map. Um, our goal was to add a creative disruption into the landscape of documentary film finance um, by offering a real and meaningful contribution to the film conversation about sustainability in the field from the filmmaker perspective. Um, and to stimulate ongoing conversation about the relationship between philanthropic, public, and private funding, because it really does, in my mind, take all of these sources working together um, kind of in harmony in order to have a robust and sustainable documentary film uh, landscape. Um, and now our goal with the design and production of the Money Map version 2, um, we've been focusing on increasing the clarity, simplicity, transparency, and utility of the money map 
um, in order to really um, encourage and champion its youth among nonfiction filmmakers. Um, our baseline research has indicated, again, that indie docs has, has supported what we knew anecdotally, that indie doc makers really use these um, resources. And my sense is that people, A, didn't know about eligibility, but B, felt a little bit intimidated by, um, you know, the tax language and by the mechanisms of it because it's just, you know, not a part of our, of our nonfiction culture. So we really are trying to, as filmmakers ourselves, um, I really think of Finance Institute as really an artist to artist organization as an arts community. And because we were not experts in, in taxes or policy or anything, but, but coming at this as filmmakers and film community members, um, we thought, well, if we, let's make this so that we can understand it and then we know that others can understand it. So um, the Money Map version two, we can talk about that as we click through later on, but um, really we're trying to make it even more um, clear, simple, transparent, and user-friendly. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's, all, it's always hard to raise money, but it, it shouldn't be scary. It shouldn't be mysterious. Um, it should be in the hands of everyone, and that's what we, that's what we hope we've done with the money map version two. Should I keep going? Oh, great. Um, so um, I think that you have a couple of slides on here. I didn't know if you wanted to kind of walk us through um, sure, yeah, let's do that. Um, so everyone can see this, the, this first slide that, that's up here, I assume. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump to the second slide here. And this map that you see here, this is a hyperlinked slide that's embedded in the PDF if you download it from the Finance Institute website. Um, and you can see that it's color-coded. Um, can I scroll down? Down at the bottom of this page, um, when you get onto the PDF version, you can see there's a little legend, and you can see what the different uh, state color coding is so that you can quickly see the different kind of tax incentive program. And it's hyperlinked, so you would be able to click directly to the uh, tax incentive uh, program for that particular state. Um, another thing that the Money Map um, features is a – do I have that? Yes, a state-by-state -state comparison chart. Um, and what you can see is that um, on the left-hand side, you can see what is the minimum qualifying spend or the amount of production budget you need to be spending in a given state in order to qualify to even apply for the tax incentive program. Um, and then it also uh, indicates the incentive size, right? So let's say you're, if you have a film, well, I could shoot it in Texas, or I could shoot it in Oklahoma, or I could shoot it in Nebraska, or whatever. You can see um, at a glance, uh, you know, which state might be a better fit for your production budget. Now, again, you know, you need to check every given state. You know, some states, that amount that you have to spend, as long as you spend it in that state, they don't care how long it takes. In other cases, it could be, oh, no, you have to have spent it within, I don't know, a calendar year or a fiscal year or whatever. So you need to do your research, but this guide um, is a helpful place to start. Um, other things that are included in this version of the guide is a step-by-step -step guide to getting a tax credit in a sample state. In this case, Ohio, the Buckeye State. Thank you, Ohio. Um, and the goal with the step-by-step -step guide is to really help you to get a picture of what the process looks like. Um, and probably a lot of the filmmakers who are on this webinar are sort of familiar with the process of, for example, applying for a grant or the process of submitting your film to a festival or for a broadcaster for consideration. But it's a different sort of step-by-step -step process for applying for a tax credit program. So by walking people through, um, you get a, 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 a sort of a mental map of, of how you do it. Um, and one of the things, and let's see, is there, is there, I'm going to skip forward and we'll come back to that. No, okay. One of the things um, that uh, can be confusing to filmmakers is that a lot of the language um, in this realm of tax incentives is similar. So the general umbrella program is often called tax credits. Um, when you initially apply, they might be tax credit eligible, like if you actually spend this much money in state and prove it, 
then you'll get, you know, X amount of money um, or X amount of a tax credit. Um, and then once you do all of that and you get your actual tax credit certificate that you can redeem, um, uh, that, that's using that language yet again. So we do, we have included a glossary that is more clear than I am right now. <laughs> um, but to really help explain the ABCs of tax incentive program. Um, I'm going to jump forward for a second to show another thing that's included in the money map version too. This time we've, we've also included two case studies um, from film producers who have successfully um, been awarded tax incentive finance, one in the state of North Carolina and one in the state of Colorado. Um, and this way, film users of the guide can get that kind of personal um, uh, uh, perspective from, from the film producer. What was their journey like and what do they wish they had known or what advice would they have and so on. So there's a couple of page case study for um, each of those two, two states. Um, so we feel like, um, and then of course, there's still the state by state cheat sheet, which is a listing of every, uh, state program with more detail. And of course, we also noted, you know, that a lot of these aren't, um, they may not have uh, a tax incentive program, but they might have grant programs and they have other types of programs. So there's also a cheat sheet for that as well. So we feel like it's a pretty robust resource and um, and I feel strongly that this should be a part of every independent filmmaker's kind of mental toolkit. Um, whether you plan to use it on your current project or not, hopefully there'll be many, you know, projects yet to come. So, you know, um, I think it's really important to familiarize ourselves with these processes, to familiarize ourselves with what it means to work with our state and municipal film commissions and film offices, how do we as nonfiction filmmakers um, learn to hold hands with, you know, civic entities and, and everything along the process and to, to really be partners in, um, in, in this aspect of creating public media. So I hope it's a, a really useful tool and that everybody will download it. Yay. This is really so exciting to see. I mean, the first edition of this was equally exciting. I love this um, edition of the case studies in here. Um, so thank you, Roddy, for that overview. And you guys also have a video online that you had um, recently we, released? Yeah, well, we just it's an introductory video, so it's about 25 seconds. Um, but it's a video that, that gives a briefer introduction and overview to this. And it's an easy way for folks who want to share this money map with others rather than trying to spit out everything that I'm struggling to spit out right now <laughs> to forward um, the link to that. Um, and it, um, through it, people can go directly, you know, again, to the money map on the Sundance Institute website. So um, please do share, if you think this would be a useful resource to other independent filmmakers, um, please do share it. And, you know, of course, the Docsville Money Map was designed with documentary filmmakers in mind, um, but it's useful information for other kinds of filmmakers as well. So please take a look. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we, yeah, definitely, um, for all you film commissioners, people at state arts agencies or filmmakers, anyone who's on the line who knows someone who might benefit from this, share away. So I'm going to pass this over to Cynthia Lopez. Um, to, to talk a little bit more about her involvement with this project as well. Thank you, Roddy, and thank you, Jax. I have to say for myself, what's so invigorating in seeing the um, Doc Money Map 2 is that I think for most people uh, in society, you know, I, I'm not quite sure that they see the documentary storytellers and the businesses that they create as micro businesses in their community. And, um, you know, that's, I have to say, I, I spent uh, close to 14 years at PBS at the POV series, and then I went on to become uh, the New York City Film Commissioner. And one of the things that I was very, you know, very intrigued by was when I looked at how the major studios were shooting in New York, 
in other states across the United States and how they were the economic engines to contribute to local businesses in those states. I always, similar to Roddy, I had the need to understand more about how documentaries, how their business model works, how for years, you know, at PBS, you know, the pie consisted of, the fundraising pie consisted of, you know, filmmakers going out and getting um, resources from philanthropic institutions, some state and local uh, government agencies, you know, the NEA, the NEH, but most of the business model was not structured at all to look at what other tax credits, tax, you know, benefits and or other incentives were available in each of the states where these businesses were developed. And that led me to really try to understand more how this could be a potential way to work creatively to be one of the aspects of a sustainability plan in the future. Um, from my perspective, I often think about, you know, right now you have in certain states where the film commission will go to the airport and greet a potential production that is scouting in their state. And I kept on thinking, gosh, it would be wonderful if independent filmmakers who live in that state could tag along with the film commission to talk about the kinds of amazing opportunities that exist in that state for talent, for how, different resources in that community. And so for me, you know, one of the things that Roddy and the team talked, you know, at length about was how can indie filmmakers and nonfiction filmmakers work um, collaboratively with their film commissions and think about other ways, even outside of the tax credit, that potentially they can collaborate. And so we, you know, came up with, you know, is your film commission indie friendly and, you know, other ways to be a hometown hero as examples um, to really delineate how independent filmmakers who are developing documentary or indie projects could work with their film commissions. For instance, they can host panel discussions about filmmaking in their community, or they can work cleverly to try to figure out what are the training needs, the workforce uh, development needs in that community to encourage more film production in that community. Um, so there are a myriad of ways, and we've listed out um, in, in, in the guide, if we look at page seven and eight, the potential workforce training initiatives opportunity, the workforce diversity initiative, how best to um, use underutilized real estate, if you will, in local communities to support the artistic community. Um, so we delineate here, I think, quite, you know, in different ways, how best, you know, indie filmmakers could work with their film commissions. And I know later on we'll hear from Herb and we'll hear from Lance on how they work together. But from my perspective, I do think what's, what's a challenging time in terms of raising money for film projects is also an exciting time. Because sometimes when we think about the current resources that are available locally, if we can weave together what would be considered, you know, government funding with philanthropic funding, with private resources, and as well as looking at in-kind resources that cities, states, and municipalities can offer, there are more resources available, I believe, um, and I definitely saw this in New York City, um, that can be leveraged to support creatives in, that, in, 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 in local areas. Um, the other thing that I think, you know, is really important is that in this mindset of thinking, when we think about, when I think about a documentary production, it could range from one documentary, could rate, their budget could be 350000 or it could range to $2.6, $2.7 million. So that is, you know, 
a sizable budget, you know, that's a very sizable budget and it employs a variety of people. So currently, we need, from my perspective, we need to do more research um, to really start evaluating when you think about, okay, let's take Ohio, for instance, or San Francisco. How many documentaries are produced in one year? How many people are being employed in these micro-businesses over that year? What does the look and feel of the people that are being employed? And is there are there opportunities for some of the people who work in the doc field who are amazing filmmakers to use some of those skills in the indie feature film um, arena or even in the industry arena. So those kinds of hybrid opportunities are a consequence of, from my perspective, looking at this business model in a very different and holistic way. So I have to say, I have to congratulate Roddy and the entire team at Sundance because, you know, often as when I was commissioner, I would see so many charts that had this and, you know, had information about eligibility and requirements. But there, this is really um, the first comprehensive guide that is really user friendly. And at the same token, it takes each of the hyperlinks takes you exactly to where you need to go to get the information you need to get to be able to apply. Um, again, from my perspective, I would only ask that nonfiction filmmakers as well as indie feature filmmakers really begin to have a relationship with your film commission well in advance of you applying for a tax credit. Um, it's really important for them to understand who you are in the community and the kinds of productions that you are engaged in developing, as well as for you to understand the kinds of uh, workforce or training programs that they have developed so that there's a clear understanding of what's going on. Um, so I, you know, I want to stop here, Jack, just in terms of this portion of the presentation, but I, I strongly encourage people, I have to say I feel in such a luxury position to have worked on the NEA Summit Report and at the same time have worked on uh, the DOC Money Map in this crucial time when I believe filmmakers need more resources to be able to ensure that their businesses can, you know, uh, find additional sustainable ways to thrive. Well put, Cynthia. So um, that was a, a, a really uh, exciting overview, and um, I'm really excited to dive into the new report and have other people look at that as well. So um, thank you for that broad overview of the landscape there. Um, you guys are power women. So... Um, after taking a look at this broader landscape, I'd like to just drill down to take a closer look at the landscape from the perspective of a film office. So we do have Herbert Niles here um, in the office and Lance Kramer. So I'm going to um, turn this over to Herbert, and uh, he can talk a little bit about the, what's going on at the D.C. Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment. Well, thank you again for having me, and um, it was great to have that overview, and I think it's going to be helpful for us now to um, pivot to um, how it works in a single jurisdiction. And we can talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about our program, our incentive program in terms of design and goals and mission. Uh, and then we can talk a little bit about the relationship that Lance's, Lance and his company had with our office and how we developed that relationship and how it culminated in uh, him being able to apply for um, a, uh, for the incentive and receiving the incentive. So just to give a little bit of an overview, um, just to let everyone know, if you want to reach out to our office to get more information about our program, you can email us at film at dc.gov, and I'll be happy to give you more information. You can also go to our website, which is entertainment.dc.gov. Uh, but basically, our program is relatively simple. Um, you need to have a minimum expenditure, qualifying expenditure in the District of Columbia of $250,000. And based on the categories of your spending, whether it be um, a qualifying expenditure that has a tax uh, uh, obligation, sales or use tax, 
That would be 35% category. The 21% category would be a category that doesn't have a sales or use tax. It might be a service with no tax added. It might be, you know, unprepared food that doesn't have a tax, sales tax to it. That would be 21%. Then our incentive covers 30% for cast and crew. And in the case of, of Lance's company, employees of, of the company that worked on the project, that would be at 30%. And then uh, out-of-state uh, cast or crew would be at, at 10%. Um, so the goal of our program was not just to attract the typical Hollywood film to come to D.C. for three or four weeks or six weeks and then leave. Though so that kind of activity um, is uh, – you know, very sought after, and we kind of look at it kind of like a trade show. Just like you'll have a convention center in your city that, you know, has a car show come in, and it's a big hit, but, and then leave. We also wanted the program to touch and incent uh, local indigenous production companies and, and independent contractors that are here 24-7, that have brick-and-mortar presence here year-round, that hire people uh, full-time. So we wanted to have a balanced program. So as an example, in 2016, um, our program had 12 awardees. Seven were your traditional, you know, Hollywood or out-of-state applicants. And then, but we had uh, five applicants that were local uh, Washington, D.C. film companies. And three of those five were actually documentary and nonfiction. So it was very important to us to be welcoming to uh, a diverse cross-section of, of the um, filmmaking uh, ecosystem. And uh, so that's a little bit about our program. I guess we could pass it to Lance. And Lance can talk a little bit about how he developed the relationship with us, how he kind of navigated understanding our program, and how it could work for him, and then sort of what the, what the process was administratively as we went from sort of the application process through his production uh, cycle and then um, – through the submission of his uh, expense report and audit, and then ultimately uh, getting issued his rebate. Yeah, sure. I can, I can pick up from there. Um, this is Lance. Um, and, you know, when we first, when my brother and I first started our production company in 2010, one of the first things that we did was reach out to the film office um, and just introduce ourselves and had an informational meeting with Herbert and, the then director of the film office. And, you know, we were in our early twenties. Um, you know, we didn't have, we hadn't, we didn't have a film under our belt. Um, we had never run a business, never run a small business. Um, and so all this was new to us, but, uh, it felt like a natural place to start to just get connected with the film office. Um, let them know who we were, let them have a sense of what we were trying to do with our film work and with our film careers. And that wound up being really important because when hearings started happening at the city council about the rebate program, um, Herbert reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to testify in front of city council on behalf of the local filmmaking community. Just to take a step back, the reason why we were having hearings at D.C. City Council was that at that time, D.C. had a filled rebate program, but it wasn't authorized with funding. So it was there, but a bit of a shell. Um, and then on top of that, um, the program that was at least there on the books had a cutoff or a qualifying threshold of $500,000, which um, meant that basically any film that had spent less than $500,000 in the district would not qualify. So we felt like um, the way it was structured, to Herbert's point, was heavily tilted towards um, attracting these out-of-town productions and really didn't have much of an infrastructure at all to help out the local indigenous uh, filmmakers, whether it be narrative or documentary filmmakers, who had small businesses, were making indie films that you know would have a budget under a half a million dollars. So one of the things that we tried to do then over the course of what wound up being several years was build a relationship with the film office, help them to understand the dynamics of what go into both making a indie doc and then also running a small business day to day and keeping a staff of independent documentary filmmakers working, you know, five days a week on salary um, and what that looks like 
the challenges we face, the things that we're hoping to do with our films. Um, and that became an ongoing conversation that, you know, I'd say every six months or so, at least, we would get together and have some sort of touch point. Um, over the course of about three or four years, I wound up testifying four times in front of city council to make this argument um, and kind of share evidence and help inform and educate the council members about these points. Um, thankfully, after several years, the program was both reauthorized and then that budget threshold was lowered from $500,000 to $250,000, which meant that for our film, City of Trees, that we had been working on, that we started in 2010 and finished in 2015, we could qualify because the but the total budget for the film wound up being $406,000, and the DC qualifying spend was, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it was about $256,000. So we were like five or $6,000 over this new threshold, this qualifying threshold. So what that meant was that then with our small, relatively small, you know, compared to a large out-of-town project, but big for us project, we were able to qualify um, and then embark on this process that Herbert alluded to of going through the application, which meant that we had to hire an outside auditor who came in and looked at the five years of books, of bookkeeping um, and contracts and paperwork that we had for the film um, to make sure that our bookkeeping practices were sound and that indeed we had met all these qualifying criteria. The audit took a long time. It cost a fair bit of money. It cost several thousand dollars. Um, but uh, the outcome of that was, and I'm skipping over some points just in the interest of time, but the outcome of that was that we were able to qualify for, um, we, we were able to qualify for a uh, $85,000 a rebate. And so that $85,000, which was a rebate, a tax, a cash rebate, not a tax uh, credit, but a rebate, then we were able to directly pour back into our company, which enabled us to pay down debts, um, and then keep our company going as an ongoing operation to make our next film um, without carrying all the kind of saddled, uh, the debt that we were saddled with. Um, and, and a lot of the struggles that we had carried with us from the first, from City of Trees into the next project. Um, so I think the thing, I'll just wrap here, that the things that, that um, I just wanted to reinforce on this call were that, um, you know, if you're in a state that's not on that money map right now, um, which is an amazing resource, uh, but if you're in one of the states or jurisdictions that's not on the map, don't be discouraged and don't feel like you don't have agency because I think that as filmmakers, we carry a whole lot of agency and the representatives and civil servants, public servants like Herbert and other jurisdictions, I, I have to believe are looking for people like us, for independent filmmakers, to get active, to build these relationships, to find small wins that we can work on together, you know, to make common sense arguments that are good for the city, good for business, good for filmmakers. Um, that can help to uh, uh, bring independent filmmakers into into this rebate uh, ecosystem, where in some cases we might be left out and have um, win-win situations. So there's an article that I wrote that's in the documentary uh, International Documentary Association magazine. Um, I think Jax can share the link that walks in more detail through our process of um, making the film testifying, working with the film office to get this program back up and running, applying for the audit um, and receiving the rebate. And then we also published the audit itself so that that could be available as a resource to anyone. Um, and I'm certainly here, you know, in this call to also just help answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Lance, for sharing that. Um, I mean, this is really powerful to have you both on here uh, talking to help best illustrate the role of how a filmmaker uh, can partner up with a film office and really work together on a variety of initiatives towards a, a common vision. So I, it's really nice to see that. Um, so we're going to move into um, some – I'm, I'm going to just pose some questions to you guys as panelists. Um, to, to get a little bit more information here. 
Um, and then we'll open this up for a public Q&A um, after that. But I just wanted to pitch a question to the presenters um, to just talk a little bit about the motivating factors and the projects that you've taken on. I, th I think you've each touched on it in different ways, but I think that there's some deeper background that has propelled you to take on some of this work. Um, well, I'll this start. This is, Herbert, uh, this is Herbert talking. Um, um, I alluded to it in sort of my overview uh, of the goals and the mission of the program as we redesigned it, and, and Lance also touched on some of the changes that were made um, in order to make it more accessible to um, independent filmmakers, uh, local filmmakers, uh, aspiring filmmakers. Um, and one of the goals is not just to drive, you know, huge economic dollars to the city, which is very important. And, you know, what I tell people um, in community discussions, saying, oh, why don't you uh, just focus on, on the local communities? I say, well, some of those big projects that come in are helping to fund these other programs. And it's again, so it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. But that said, sometimes jurisdictions just uh, look for the dollar. Um, and so one of my motivating factors was building relationships within the community and doing the best that I could to make sure that it was a balanced program, as I described. When you have a program and you have 12 awardees and, you know, five of them are, are local, um, that's a pretty good percentage when you look at um, some of the other uh, incentive programs around the country, and we're, and we're very proud of that. Uh, so that would be my answer, just to always keep our eyes, you know, because as a, a municipal, you know, government agency. Um, there's that balance between being the patron of your local community and also being a facilitator. And the, the sort of the theme of, of this discussion is sustainability. And the goal is to create an ecosystem, to create a balance of opportunities and production resources that doesn't have the indigenous community completely dependent um, on grants and incentives but that balance, that being a piece and allowing them to get enough work and to create enough content that they can be sustainable and, you know, down the road, they, they need that incentive, they need those grants less. So, again, and to, to, to summarize, just the focus and what motivates me is to make sure our city has a balanced program and that we always keep an eye on supporting the people that live in our city, the people that pay my salary, the people that elect the city council and the mayor. And to forget and to always remember who your actual constituents are. Uh, this Great. Is Roddy. Uh, Roddy? Yeah, um, thanks. I, you know, as I said, I was, you know, uh, with the Sundance Documentary Fund for more than a decade, and, you know, it was always an honor to be able to support so many vital and independent storytellers. Um, but it was also it can also be um, you know painful to see when people feel like there's just not enough resources out there, right? And people um, struggling to get the right match of of you know foundation support and and you know you know to get uh, broadcast agreements and so on. And so I really felt strongly that wow, we need you know um, we're I feel like artists are also enterprise people. Um, and we need to be thinking bigger about or, or thinking differently about where the resources are and aren't. And, you know, these are projects that are bringing philanthropic dollars in um, to communities um, by virtue of their production spend. Um, and it made sense that, that, that those communities also, you know, match with or, or, or contribute also to their local programs. So, it was really about how do we find a new source of resource um, for independent filmmakers who I felt like we were, I felt like, you know, one one fund would close, another fund would open, one fund would open two years later, but it was a, a shuffling of the existing pot. So I was really excited to think, wait a second, there's a whole other pot over there that for whatever reason we're not engaging with. Um, that's crazy. <laughs> um, so um, I'm, you know, again, as, as um, you know, Sundance is, is both about 
projects, but it's also about, of course, people. We're just the, the, the storytellers, and and how do we meet um, a wide range of of needs so that so that people can can do their work and continue doing their work. And um, and I really just am excited that you know it really was a, a collaborative um, project with you know uh, Sundance and and you know the IDA and and everyone. So. Um, you know, but uh, that was the motivation for for doing this is to really try to put more, um, really more a sense of more power over fundraising into the hands of independent filmmakers. Um, that's really the goal, just empowering the artist. Great, thanks, Roddy. Uh, Cynthia, did you want to jump in? Um, yes, I. You know, I can't agree more. Um, with what has been said. And again, from my perspective, having had, you know, having been at PBS for many years and then, uh, you know, on the film commission in New York City, I would have to say that uh, there's three things that I constantly think about when I think about nonfiction storytellers. One is the, the critical nature so right now, I have to say, this morning I woke up and I'm reading all these different newspapers, and yet I'm online trying to look for video um, on what's happening in the Caribbean, right? And so people are hungry for a very holistic approach to information about what is happening in society today. And what's exciting about this conversation is that, you know, I believe that the public infrastructure, whether it's public arts funding or the local micro business, similar to what Lance describes that he's built with his brother, or, you know, the film commission, you know, in, in terms of the workforce development programs that Herb has worked on, you know, we benefit from really building our public infrastructure and then working very creatively with private partnerships. So from my perspective, again, if we look at, quote, unquote, the entertainment um, landscape and we look at the documentary landscape, these things should not be juxtaposed, but rather we, we need to think creatively on how, um, you know, I, I have to say I can't tell you how many times, Jax, I've walked into, you know, sort of a public institution. It happened the other day where I was walking into a university and someone said to me, Cynthia, you know, I know you've been working with the NEA on this report because the report is getting distributed so widely. And, you know, he said to me, my first grant was an NEA grant and look where I am now. And, you know, I, I don't want to mention the individual um, without speaking to him about it, but, you know, he is at a corporation doing some amazing things. But his start was at the NEA, right? So for me, these types of investments, these public investment dollars are so vital for us to think about how the local, uh, as I said before, micro businesses start and flourish. And we also have to be mindful that, you know, as Herbert was saying before, um, you know, for me, I have to say as being on the film commission side, uh, you know, I, I kept on saying education, education, education. First, learn what we're doing. Try to understand, you know, from the film, make, film commission's perspective, learn about the programs we currently have and what we're doing. And then, you know, talk to us about what you'd like to do and how you kind of can work together with us um, to develop new things. And so, you know, I do see this as uh, these two reports as vital tools that people can use to do this work locally. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. That was, that was really exciting to hear also that uh, the report's getting around. Yay. Uh, Lance, did you want to chime in here? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would just add that, you know, a lot of the field is so built on a project-based model. Um, and I'm specifically indie documentary filmmaking, it's, um, it's the funding models, the distribution models, um, crew configurations, so many things are based on uh, projects as being the organizing principle. And so 
while that produces, in many cases, these wonderful films that we all love, one of the hard things is that then when you wrap up a project, you wind up being faced with uh, this, you can be one, you can wind up facing this struggle of then having to do it all over again and start from scratch the next time that you want to make your next film. And I think that that lack or shortcoming of the ongoing um, kind of structures that provide uh, the baseline of sustainability and support that can keep someone making films day in and day out over a sustained career um, are really, I think, one of the things that I've tried to focus on because I want to be making films and I want to be having a uh, career as a filmmaker that I can support myself and a family and live a comfortable life and um, and not just me, but 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 see others who have you know, more or less resources than me do the same. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, these types of programs like the tax incentives and working with the cities are ways that we start to tap into resources that are not just project based but that um, allow people who are there to support these industries day in and day out see us as a, a, a meaningful contribution to the city's economy or a state's economy on an ongoing basis, and then work with us to just make sure that we can be, you know, a part of uh, the, the, you know, programs and policies that they're designing that, that – um, that you know make these make the communities where we live a, a, you know a, uh you know vibrant economy. So I think a lot of times we get left out of the equation or left out of the conversation because we wind up being so project based. Um and I think that you know that 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 day in and day out uh drive to be a filmmaker should be I think what what gets people involved in these types of conversations. Definitely. Uh thanks Lance. So I was at this show last night, and someone said, um, a warrior is a person who seeks to protect and serve their communities using the resources you have. And I really liked that, and I feel like each of you are really embodying that. So thank you for being warriors in your communities, really. It's powerful. <laughs> so hopefully this inspires more <laughs> warriorship. So um, thanks, everyone, for participating in this conversation. We actually, um, since we're at 3.53, we're going to open this up to the public for some questions. Um, there is an icon at the top of your screen that says Q&A, and if you click on that, you're able to submit a question by typing into the box, um, and then we will broadcast that to our presenters. So I'm going to wait a second, and uh, we have two other people in the room here. We have Sarah Burford and Sarah Metz, our lovely media arts specialist here at the NEA. We couldn't live without them. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have them moderate uh, this portion. Thanks, Jax. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah Burford. Um, our first question to the presenters um, is from someone who is interested in better understanding the concerns and issues um, from public officials in their immediate community. And they're wondering if you'd have any recommendations um, about how to find out more information on what's going on at a local level uh, to, you know, what are the issues that are really affecting and influencing documentary makers? Um, this is Herbert. I'll take that really quickly. I mean, uh, I'll start by saying each jurisdiction, each town, each state is different, and the local government and the level of support is different in each jurisdiction. So, you know, you got to kind of do your own research. But um, I would say a couple of things. First, I would say just go to your government website, call your government arts commission, and find out if there are any programs, and then you just got to do your legwork. But uh, on that point of influencing your community and how the government supports you, I just want to say something that Lance talked about was really getting involved with your city council, uh, with your mayor, and always remember that the community, any community that bands together, including the arts community, has power if they use it. And you, you vote, and they understand that you vote. And whether they necessarily like the arts or not, if they get 20 calls a day, or if they have a city council hearing and there are 50 people sitting in those chairs and they're all talking about we need more support for the arts, 
they understand that that kind of passion and activism turns into votes. And so just from a purely Machiavellian political point of view, I know it's, you know, it's a lot of time being a great artist and you're hustling, but the time that you put in to connecting with your local community and advocating for the arts community can, can have great dividends. So I just wanted to make that point as well. This, this is Lance. I'll just add something to what Herbert said, which is that from the filmmaker perspective and as an independent artist, a lot of times, uh, you know, we can be averse to talking about or thinking about numbers. And so I think that as we have done a better job quantifying the impact of um, something like making a documentary film, especially the economic impact, um, but also the employment impact and whatnot, that's helped bridge that communication gap um, because numbers are, those types of numbers transcend through the arts, through public policy and, and whatnot. Thanks. Um, we do have another question, um, which is a good question. It's asking if a project takes place in more than one or two states, uh, you know, what does a filmmaker do? Can they do they pick one state to work with concerning the tax incentives? So this is Herbert again. I'll take that. So in the case of of our jurisdiction, it doesn't matter if you did you know part of your project in California, part of your project in New York, and then came down to D.C. So long as you qualify, so long as the portion of your project that you're filming in Washington D.C hits that threshold of $250,000 in the case of our law, it doesn't matter how many other jurisdictions that you're filming in. So my suggestion as you're doing your pre-production planning is to have that understanding of the different laws in the different states. And if your documentary or your nonfiction project has a lot of mail use and you have to go to different places, do kind of understand what the thresholds are and how much you can get from each jurisdiction and so that you can plan, so all right, well, we need to hit this number in order to get anything from this jurisdiction and to plan it. But again, it all goes like you, the other pre-production planning you do. Just understand the landscape. But in the case of our jurisdiction, uh, it doesn't matter how many other places that you film, so long as you, your, your production activity, once you're in, in D.C., uh, qualifies under our legislation. Great. Our next question is um, for Cynthia. And um, Cynthia had mentioned in-kind resources uh, during your presentation. And we have a question about um, if you can offer um, any specific examples of the kinds of in-kind resources that might be available to an indie filmmaker or um, to a production company in their local community. What are the ways that those can be leveraged? Sure. Um, there's a couple of different ways. One is um, in, in New York City, for instance, there is something called the Made in New York Marketing Incentive. So filmmakers can apply if their film is um, meets, again, a threshold. I believe it's 80% of it is shot in New York. They can apply for free bus and subway advertising. And it's on a first-come, first-served basis. And as you can imagine, if the city is underwriting this, you know, um, the applications, there's a very sort of uh, elaborate, very easy, but elaborate application program where you submit your application, but it's on a first-come, first-served basis. And it's really strictly for premieres at, in certain theaters, I mean, in theaters, or it can be a digital premiere at this point as well, or a broadcast premiere. So I often encourage filmmakers who do not live in New York and may not have access to a marketing incentive in their um, municipality to, again, approach the film office and try to understand what their relationship is to the tourism office. Because, excuse me, Often there are um, collaborations between the film office and the tourism office, and there are potential uh, there are potential strategies that can be used to help promote the film once it's completed. Um, so understanding that that potentially could be one way to work. Um, second way is often there are 
location fees, um, particularly if you're a museum or a library or even certain public parks um, have location fees. However, if you work strategically with that location, there could be ways that you can collaborate and kind of, uh, instead of there being an exchange where a doc or a nonfiction filmmaker would have to pay for that location fee, there might be something else that can be exchanged, um, whether it's promotion, et cetera, you know, making sure that, you know, that particular location is sort of a partner in your partnerships and is listed on all of your promotional materials, so potentially location fees, and travel. Um, again, going back to the tourism department, since the tourism department usually has all really good relationships with most of the airlines and other and then the hotels and the vendors um, in their city, um, depending upon what you need as a filmmaker, if you're flying, if you are not working in your hometown and you're flying in, there may be one or two in-kind um, opportunities that could exist um, through the tourism office. Um, and again, you would have to figure out what the partnership could be, potentially what you would be offering them um, in terms of promotion or in terms of partnership. So those are, in my mind, three ways advertising, it could be location fees, or it could even be some travel expenses, um, depending upon what munici what city, state, municipality you're in. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Um, and we have one last question, which uh, I'll direct to uh, Roddy, which is we actually heard from somebody um, from a state that was not on the money map, but they said that they're it has a great incentive program. So if this is the case, um, who can people contact if they realize their state is not on the map? Well, if their state uh, should be on the map, they should definitely contact us at Sundance Institute. And um, the, our information is on the back of the money map. Um, I don't want to try to spell out an email address, but, um, but definitely be in touch with us to try DFP, as in Documentary Film Program, at Sundance.org um, would be a good way to start. Um, and we do recognize that a lot of states have different incentive programs for in-state or out-of-state um, uh, companies or productions. And we focused on listing the out-of-state eligibility because we knew that this is a nationwide audience and you know, in other words, people needed to be able to look at the whole country, not just where they were. But there's additional information that you can, you know, each link will take you straight to that tax incentive page. Um, and then, again, there's the state-by-state -state cheat sheet on the back. So there's additional resources for further um, research um, and, um, and everything. Uh, so if you're a film office or a film commission, and you want to update or um, any of the information on the map, contact the Documentary Film Program um, at Sundance.org. Um, and um, if you're a filmmaker, definitely do additional research. Um, our number one goal with the map is to inspire um, a sense of you know, empowerment to use these tools to partner with state and local film offices um, to see these as resources and to do your own research, um, we feel like the most important thing is to understand what are the questions that you need to ask um, because by next year, um, you know, all any of these programs might be different. Um, and again, they might be different if you're an in-state versus an out-of-state company. So, um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Roddy. Okay, guys. Uh, well, that was an amazing conversation. I am so glad that you guys were here as our experts talking on this topic. Um, so thank you. Uh, this conversation will actually be archived and available on our website in a few weeks, so people can share that link. And if there's anybody on the webinar that wants to revisit a few points in here, that will be available to you. I just wanted to point out before we leave that the, um, the report that we have also features a case study on the DC Office of Cable Television, Entertainment, Film, Music. So um, be sure to check that out, it's on page 23, and that is on their workforce development initiative. 
And also we do have a feature on the Sundance stock money map in there as well. Um, and before we, um, before we sign off, I'd uh, like to say thank you to everyone for being here. And we have another webinar coming up on October 12th. That's on strengthening communities through regional programs and public broadcast initiatives. And we have Teresa Hollingsworth from South Arts on the call with Sue Shart from the Association for Independence and Radio and Chris Hastings from World Channel. So we hope that you tune in for that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.